could you tell me more about um, the physical challenges, how you prepare yourself for that and how you overcome those physical challenges when you're climbing? The physical challenges that you face in the mountains depends on, depend very much on where you are. So, um, for example, I have climbed in the Himalayas, the Andes and Alaska. And in Alaska, the main challenges are associated with the extreme cold um, up there. The fact that the ice starts so low, so you're sleeping on ice right from the bottom of the mountain ranges, basically. Um, and so, for example, if you want to go climbing, if you have to walk into a mountain, you're going to be pulling a sledge. That sledge is likely to weigh close to the same weight as the person who's pulling it, not far off. Um, and so to train for that, for example, I used to have a harness and I would, when I was living in Leicester, I had three car tires attached to the back of my harness and I would just drag these car tires around the park in Leicester for hours, just practicing like what it would feel like and using the muscles that I would be using to pull that sledge along. Um, other mountain ranges like the Himalayas or, um, or in the Andes, the snow starts much higher. So there's less pulling of sledges, but there's much more weight in a rucksack. So for those, I wear my rucksack, fill it with bottles of water, um, and then just go for really long hikes, carrying bottles of water. I learned a really important lesson there. The first time I did it, I filled it with uh, a load of books, you know, the complete works of William Shakespeare, the Oxford English Dictionary to make it heavy. But it turns out that I, I, I'm really attached to those books. And when it got really hard, I couldn't just ditch them. Whereas if you fill it with water, you can always pull the water out halfway if you find you're struggling. So lesson learned on that front. But yeah, in general, though, really high levels of fitness. So um, good routines of, of cardiovascular exercise. Your lung and heart health has to be um, one of the most important things. So trying to keep healthy. So you um, mentioned um, that you've explored a range of environments. Um, could you describe a time where you've seen um, the effects of global warming firsthand? Yeah, certainly. So in the Andes, we tend to go back to the same regions um, multiple times and use the same access routes. And over maybe 10 years, more 15 years of going back to that same region um, and taking similar photographs, we can physically see in the images the glaciers retreating up um towards the tops of the mountains in fact a mountain that we climbed we climbed the third highest uh, waterfall in chile a few years ago to gain access to a really remote brutal technical mountain and when we got to the top of the waterfall we found the remains of a glaciology station that had been set up decades earlier they'd taken a helicopter taken equipment and been monitoring the the glacier but from the point where they had left their equipment all those decades ago we could no longer see the glacier it had disappeared out of sight up the mountain. And so those kind of things really leave the sort of haunting feeling of, of something lost. Um, what keeps you motivated? I'm really goal orientated. And so if you give me a task, then that's, that's it. That's what, you know, I really get my teeth into. That's what I want to achieve. So mountaineering is great for me in that sense, because there's a series of goals. If, if I'm climbing multiple mountains in one expedition, there's a series of goals that, that run one after the other. And so it's easy to have a focus on the summit. That's actually a dangerous thing to be too focused on the summit though, because it means that um, you're less likely to turn back in a situation where you need to. So you have to be slightly careful with that. But actually in terms of motivation, I really, don't struggle too much with that because I'm really internally motivated. So you find, I think that people tend to be internally or externally motivated and that really affects their reasons for their own behaviors. So for example, um, you might go and climb a particularly famous mountain that everyone's heard of. And um, that's, that's great if you're externally motivated because people have heard of it and you sort of generate enthusiasm from people. Um, if you're internally motivated, then you have a very different outlook on the way that you do things. And so we go and climb mountains that no one's ever heard of and no one ever will hear of. And, you know, that's fine. I don't, I don't mind. I'm not doing it for the sake of anyone else's opinion or, or, or praise or, or thoughts, really. It's, it's, it's all about kind of goals that we set ourselves. So um, the other thing is that we have lists of mountains that we're trying to climb for that meet various criteria that we've set just for the fun of it. And so, um, as you head towards the end of a particularly challenging list. For example, um, I've done 11 of the 12 highest mountains in the Mendoza region of South America. Only one person's ever done all 12 and I've done 11. So, you know, when you get towards the end of a list like that, you're kind of thinking, although the list is meaningless, it's just a list that we made up, but 
just the thought of maybe being able to climb all the 6,000 meter mountains in that region is really is really motivating to to keep going how did it feel to when you won the bbc2 show astronauts do you have what it takes i would say that my most overriding feeling when they announced my name was complete shock because i was completely convinced and if anyone's seen the clip they'll see it on my face i was completely convinced that i was not going to win and i remember thinking to myself at the very end I was standing with my two colleagues either side of me and I just thought, well, you know, what, what will you do when they announce someone's name? I'm going to turn and hug the, whichever person it is who's just won because it's not going to be me. It's going to be one of these two people. And I just remember thinking, you know, that's, that's going to be kind of my response and it's going to be lovely. And, you know, I didn't know which of them it was going to be because they both had amazing qualities, but I was just sure it wasn't me. So when my name was read out, I just, I didn't even really know how to react. I think there's kind of a moment where I'm just standing there a, a little bit in shock before I actually react and start smiling because, and, and also just a really overwhelming feeling as well, because it had been such a long process. There had been 44 tests that we did over six weeks and it was so grueling and so draining that to finally be at the end of it was really sort of overwhelming feeling.